What pedagogical implications do you feel the DALN has? Well, the, the whole object of the DALN is to be a, um, a resource that can be used in multitudinous ways by different teachers in different classes for different purposes. Um, so the, um, there are no, there's no one set of pedagogical outcomes for the DALM. Different classes can use it, different disciplines can use it, different teachers can use it, um, different levels of instruction can use it. And I think the, the uh, best um, description of what's been done pedagogically with the DALN is in Michael Harker and Katie Comer's 2015 article in Computers and Composition about um, where they where they surveyed people who use the DALN in their classes and talked about the strengths and weaknesses of that use. Krista Bryson has also um, done an article on the DALN and then there have been dissertations done on the DAL and Deborah Kazawa's work on the digital archive uh, and especially the work she did with GBLTQ narratives uh, is useful. And then the uh, Computers and Composition Digital Press book that Louie and Scott and I and all the contributors did called The Stories That Speak to Us uh, provides something like 15 or 16 different curated exhibits of how those narratives can be used uh, both in and around classes and classrooms. Uh, so I think there's so many of these different examples. Um, people could uh, go to Google Scholar, use uh, DALN and find a lot of pedagogical description. There's also a book that uh, Ben McCorkle, Michael Harker, and Katie Comer are working on uh, aimed at the Computers and Composition Digital Press, and it will be a born digital book. And it will look specifically at how the DALN is used in different classes. So there's um, plenty of examples for people to dig into in the scholarly world. Yeah. So tell me a story about yourself using the DALN and in teaching. Um, You've mentioned the Black Columbus class that you've done. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, um, I, it's funny that the DALN, the presence of the DALN as a resource, changed my teaching because it led to the course uh, on the literacy narratives of Black Columbus. Without the DALN, I would not have done the course, and I think that course for me is probably the most important course that I teach because it takes me outside the university um, and into uh, places that I don't, uh, I don't know well enough. And so um, it's through the DALN that it was possible for me to do what I consider my best teaching. And that's another thing I'm very happy with in that regard. And I hope that class continues here at OSU as well. So what advice would you give to teachers about ways in which they can incorporate the DALN into teaching? I would, I would say that um, whatever their purpose in teaching about reading and composing practices and values, they can find a way of using the DALN to that end. Um, but they have to think in inventive ways and aim at um, uses that really meet the teachers and the students' values and ends. So the DALN is infinitely flexible um, and the teachers and students need to be imaginative and inventive in their thinking about how to use the resource. So what, changing gears a little, what would you say were experiences in your life that best prepared, prepared you and helped you in a career in digital rhetoric and composition? Well, it was that first um, effort to uh, type my dissertation into a mainframe computer. It was that was um, that provided me the space 
uh, to learn how to use technology as as a tool for composing. I would also say that Michigan Tech, where the emphasis was on the use of computer technology, that was my first job, and because uh, there's so much interest in digital technology, and there were lots of computer, um, uh, there were lots of machines, there were lots of networks, there were lots of different um, ways of using computers at Michigan Tech. I was able to play a great deal in those digital environments uh, because I had an excellent chair in Art Young and um, he gave me the space to experiment and play and investigate and uh, supported the uh, Center for Computer Assisted Instruction that I ran for so many years. Um, so that was that was part of it. And then the other part of it was working with really talented graduate students because each time you meet a graduate student, each generation of graduate students have different ways of communicating with, with and around digital uh, tools and environments. And you can learn something new from every generation of graduate students, every graduate student you meet. Um, and the, the um, pleasure of uh, learning new things every year, every term, every with every student is really a joy for me. So what advice would you give new scholars in the field of digital rhetoric and composition? Well, I would tell them. I, I know that um, many uh, new scholars are worried about tenure and promotion and the way digital works are currently valued in uh, departments of English, which tend to be a little bit more conservative and um, uh, sort of attached to the notion of the, the printed book. Um, but they're changing pretty rapidly. And so I would encourage uh, young scholars not to be bounded by the imaginations of the people who went before them, uh, and not to be overly cautious in um, uh, in their approach to digital work. I would say play and invent and experiment and follow your passions in that work. And if the work is good work, it will be valued by the time you get to tenure and promotion. And uh, the more you try and suss out what's going to be the value in six years when you go up for tenure and promotion, the less successful you're going to be. So do the work that you know to be good work uh, in the form that you know how to do it and in the environments, both digital and non-digital, uh, that attract you. And by the time you get to tenure and promotion, uh, that work will be valued. Now it might not be valued at the same place you think it's going to be valued, but it will be valued if it's good work and you will find a place where you can continue to do that work and experimentation and make your own contributions. And I think uh, I would encourage them to be bold. I mean, it is um, when uh, Gail Haywisher and I were involved in doing work in digital environments, um, there were a limited number of people doing that work, um, and it was a risk. But if we had been too careful and not um, and not engaged in that work, I think that would have been a loss to us. Uh, if we had decided that the profession was not keen on collaborative work, for instance, and we had done our individual work, that would have been a loss to us. So I think that you can't uh, predict where um, the values of the field necessarily are going to go, but you can predict where you're going to do your best work and how you're going to do your best work. So be bold and do it and hold yourself to a high standard in doing so. If you could pass along only one story about literacy, what would it be? <laughs> Hmm. Well, you know, Sam, I don't think there is one story about doing literacy. I think that there are 
everybody has multiple stories. Uh, I think I must have four different narratives in the uh, DALN, one about the songs my mother used to sing to me, one about um, you know, learning to read and write, one about uh, the ukulele today. You know, there, there are so many different stories. I, I, I guess I'd encourage people to think in uh, m multiples rather than in ones, uh, because every story is really cool and sheds light on that uh, infinite variety of human understandings and values and activities that we term literacy at this point in time, in this culture, in this environment. So now that you are ending your career, what are you planning on doing once you retire? Um, what is the thing that you are most excited for in retirement? Well, I want to read and write. <laughs> I want to put my feet up at the lake on the railing and gaze out in the lake and read my read the books that I want to read and learn more about playing the ukulele and travel and uh, learn more in that way as well. Um, I think that those are the um, I, I would like a little more time to do the kinds of literate activities uh, that uh, please me um, and that um, I'd like to I'd like to invest more of my effort in. So, we've talked a lot about about a lot of things, um, digital studies and literacy. But yeah. is there anything else that you would like to share that we haven't talked about? I don't think so. I think um, I think the next here's here's what I would say to people who are starting the profession: the next ten or twenty years are going to be so totally exciting, so open and full of possibility for uh, scholars. And um, there's so much to do and so many neat projects to take on that I would encourage people to dive in. Dive in and enjoy uh, what they find and follow their passions and make their contributions that they can be proud of when they turn around in 20 or 30 years and somebody asks them, you know, what did you do? Uh, I want them to be able to be proud of the projects they've taken on, they've contributed to, and they've uh, done within the profession. Thank you so much for this interview. O-H-I-O.